So basically with this episode, I'm just going to listen to you talk. I'm going to just sh- shut up, enjoy my monster. And you're just going to tell us stories. That's what you always say. I don't have very good stories. Sorry. So there you were mowing the lawn. Unbeknownst to me, the girl and her sister both showed up at the same time. See, you have a story. It's made up, but. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we, yeah, we can, we can still give Matt another 510. And I didn't bring out the invitation too far. I pinged a couple people, but I figured, yeah, we can keep it small. Small and focused. Okay. To what extent do you want to discuss your experience? Um, always to the extent that I can. I, I mean, especially with safety, most of the stuff I, I, I can cover. Yeah. I mean, there's the, the stuff I have to talk around, I'll talk around. Cool. Turn that off. I really think, though, in talking to people on the Facebooks, that's mostly on Facebook. It's not so much in person. A lot of people use the military as an excuse for not maintaining safety. And that's a really bad idea because much more so than the, the police that I work with, the military has a very rigid safety structure. Yeah. The, the safety planning that goes into everything is very detailed, very structured, very, it's, it's very linear. You, there's a process, you follow the process, you turn it into your command and there are, you know, appropriate levels of command for each different aspect of safety you know if it's lots of lots of life or limb uh you know you're the it's generally speaking a general officer so you know the it gets elevated up fairly high so your safety plan has to be coherent um i like i show our the i still use it in my state job the the planning system for safety because you know if i'm if i'm going to the, the middle of africa where you know, pe- people aren't fluent in their, their own language and they speak, you know, I got 15 different dialects of a language on the firing line. The, the safety level that you have to push onto the students is a lot higher than it would be if I was teaching, you know, Marines or Navy SEALs or whatever. And so I use that same system. And, the, you know, that's why I said, like the police officers that I show it to look at me like I'm speaking in tongues. Yeah. The... You know, mil- military guys, especially army, are all really familiar with it. Um, well, but it's well, I think one aspect of it which seems to baffle a lot of people is the fact that these these safety rules, the firearm safety rules, they're not just the square range thing. Therefore, when we're out and about no, dealing with threats, yeah, that's every every time you go out with a gun. I mean, that's why you know it starts with all firearms. It, it doesn't say all firearms on the range or all firearms in your safe. It's, I mean, that's a, you know, that's a declarative. Yeah. They have the same thing. Guys misunderstand, you know, safety on the flat range, but you know, how, how does that apply to an operation? And it's like, well, it, and you know, Mike Pannone is, is the best example I know of because it's a, a, a deeply personal experience or, you know, example yeah. for me. Uh, Cause he and I have been close for a long time yeah. and you know, you, you cut the corner on safety and it's not important until it is. And when yeah. you need, when you need safety, nothing else will substitute for it. Yeah. And, th- and you know, that was, that was him, him saying that to me probably 10 days after the accident when his, you know, he still had 500 stitches in his head. Yeah. My camera off? Yeah. I just figured you needed to stay anonymous, even though you oh, weren't no. in that last one. Oh no. I'm I'm long past my anonymous days. Otherwise, you just put a black box right yeah. here. Yeah. Oh, oh, the old school Oakley sunglasses. Yeah. That would that would work. And it looks like Steve Fisher might want to jump in too. I just threw out the general invite to all the guys. Just for fun. Just for fun. 
Yeah, Pannone's a great example of that. Who's lived it? Yep. And I think uh, not enough people know about who he is. No. But I, I, I hear all the time about, you know, what a, a question I get asked frequently from my, my army guys, because d- despite what people think, most people, even in special forces, really don't shoot that much or that well. And it's like, yeah. you know, who should I who should I go to for training? And like Mike Pannone is is at the very, very top of my very, very short list. And it's because he's, a, you know, a good instructor, but he's a good describer, which is more than more than anything is he gets his point across to you. And that's like one of those key instructor attributes that the guy can be the most knowledgeable person in the world. But if you don't understand him, it doesn't help. Yep. And uh, he's just, you know, he's he's a great guy and a, a, a great person and a great instructor. I remember meeting him for the first time at SHOT Show. I don't remember what year it was, but genuinely being excited to finally meet him and to just to talk to him. He's a regular guy and he is so personable and likable. And yep. his, he, the way he described things was wonderful. Just, I haven't trained with him yet. Big emphasis on yet. I might need to have him. I might need to host him. I want to, I'm, I'm actually trying to find a time when I can get into one of his classes because him and, Scott Jedlinski or that's two, two things I definitely want to do this year. And I just went through Scott's class last week and it was fantastic. Absolutely outstanding. Speaking of instructors, I understand that Matt little might be in my, in the area that I live uh, at some point next month or no in July. I'm not sure when in July, maybe we need to set up a class if you're free. I, I think we should. I think we should do that. I'd like to do that. So, uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's talk about it after this. and get Yes. Set up. Yes. Um, so basically I think Kurt and I just covered the whole episode so we can stop now. <laughs> okay. And good night, I, was everybody. Messing, I was messing with my audio, so I didn't even get to hear it. But no, it wasn't anything good. You already knew it. Um, so yeah. So some of the stuff I'd like to discuss is because there are so many misunderstandings with safety with the firearm safety rules with the applications of that and as kurt and i were just discussing how some people throw the blanket of well the military doesn't even abide by that they point their guns at everyone i think it's important to bring you guys on specifically uh to be able to address that um and then also we have matt with your with your uh, cop swat experience and the idea of pointing because i know blowers has a wonderful perspective on this and as does pressburg couldn't get either of them so i had to i had to go to you guys um basically it happens happens. what i'd also like to talk to talk about though is uh what pressburg spoke about um in training if you act if you hit your selector on someone that doesn't need to be shot you get dinged i thought that was fascinating we did that actually on cpd swat um, oh, you cool. Doing, yeah. And that could get you thrown out of selection if you did it. Yeah. Times. And just that. And you're not even pointing yet, but you're getting there. Yep. And it just shows. So. It, it, um, but also Chuck had this video on primary and secondary. I don't know if you guys heard of that channel. Um, it was talking about processor speed. And it was one of the least popular videos that I had on the channel. And he got a lot of negative press because he was being honest. He was talking about, and if you need, I can get you a copy of it. Uh, he was talking about processor speed not everyone can be an assaulter not everyone can process at the speed necessary some people are better suited for different things but if you don't have the ability to process without flipping off and and pointing this is not for you do something else and it's there's nothing wrong with doing something else i i have seen some very talented intelligent and athletic individuals that could never get cqb they just couldn't get it yeah I mean, that, that's why, yeah. you know, SWAT police uh, on the police side, SWAT cops and on the military side, Delta guys and SIF guys, that's why they get tasked to do a lot of weird things is because one of the side benefits of doing CQB a lot is that you learn to make decisions quickly. You process information fast and you and you you make a decision on that information quick because you have to because you you. You know, if you're making decisions based on things you saw in the room before, it's too late and you're going to get you killed or your teammates killed. And, and that's that's the reality. And, and that's 
you know, uh, one of the things from my school time or, you know, my schoolhouse experience, cognitive overload and instructor fatigue were the two common denominators of accidents. The, I mean, I, I looked at, in my second year there, I looked at like something 85 class A accidents and class A is where either somebody died or their uh, student lost more than 24 hours of training. And the, the, the common denominators were cognitive overload. And this is, you know, across USASOC because that was one of my jobs was reviewing USASOC safety. So cognitive overload and in schools, instructor fatigue because sharp instructors don't let students do dumb things. Yeah. But, and it's amazing how that fits into safety too, because you get that fatigued person, they're going to be more prone to yep. creating those mistakes. And this, that's one of the issues that I have. And it's, it's silly, but if we want to be realistic, if we're actually going to use USPSA as an example of, Oh, this is, uh, this is how I'm going to respond to things. You shouldn't be walking through your, through your, through your uh, course of fire first. That should surprise you. And yep. you should process on the, on the fly. If only. I used to shoot a match in Washington that they were famous for that for at least one of the stages was unknown. That would be awesome. That would be so cool. Yeah, well, that's you, what you, I loved about Darcy. Yeah. You see a lot of guys who are, you know, really excellent USPSA shooters when you put them into an unknown shoot house and tell them that you just navigate the path and shoot the targets where you find them. They don't do very well. Yeah. So I wonder looking at the way people are wired today and how video games have influenced them. If modern shooters were to put more no shoots into their video games, I'm serious about this. How would this affect their decision-making skills? So if we're playing a, sh a shooter, typically you don't have any no shoots. What if we started incorporating no shoots into shooter games where people had to make a split decision? Oh, I can't shoot that person. I need to find a threat. That could be very interesting. It, it would improve it a lot. I, I mean, yep. you know, you, Go back and, to uh, uh, who, who is Rob Latham's buddy? Um, wrote, Brian wrote the Blue Book. Brian, Brian Enos. Enos. Yes. Go, go back to his thing from from you know his original book was high speed shooting is high speed sing. Yeah. And when you start training vision, it doesn't matter how you're training it; it matters that you're training it. And when you start to see faster, you start to process faster. Yeah. And, and the flip side of the whole USPSA thing is it's one of the best venues I've found for increasing that perceptual speed with the firearm. I mean, I, I, yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I think it's, uh, it's one of the things that drive me nuts. Just guys, it's like, Oh, you shouldn't do that. It get, get you killed in the streets. It's like, I'm sorry. You're just, you're not even smart enough for me to have a conversation with you. Yep. Well, and it's like, there's, there's two shooting performance shooting alone without tactics will leave huge gaping holes in your reaction to anything, right? Yep. But tactics without skill at shooting on demand under stress leaves a huge gaping hole as well, because if you can't hit what you're going to try to shoot, all the tactics in the world may not help you. Yeah. Well, my favorite example of this is, again, at Darcy, and I bring it up all the time, if you're not skilled with your weapon at Darcy, you're – limited to this bubble right here and you're not focusing on the problems ahead of you you're focusing on keeping your gun running and how to shoot it now once you're familiar with your weapons and you can shoot them and you you run into a malfunction and you can clear it without any without any using any processor speed then you can absorb the information that's being presented well and that goes back to what kurt was saying just a minute ago like the best guys at cqb aren't just fast and accurate at perceiving the visual information and stimuli from their lane they're also in their periphery picking up what their teammates are doing, what the threats are doing, you know, cause you have your primary and secondary awareness. I mean, these guys, the guys that are really good at this are picking up everything, even yes. though they're paying attention to their jobs. Yeah. Wouldn't you say Kurt? Oh yeah. Automaticity. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> on, on it's Sephardic and the, the last exercise, <clears throat> a big portion of the last exercise is dog and pony show. Cause we get visiting generals and, group commanders want to come see their guys go through. And so there's a, a lot of looky loos that are there. And one of the questions you get asked is because they'll, they'll listen to us critique the students is how did you know he was doing that? Cause you were over here. How did you see him over here do that? And it's like, well, cause I knew what he was supposed to do and that's not what he did. And so that keyed off that something was wrong. And so, you know, peripherally I saw him do X instead of Y. 
It's like, cause you know, I, yeah, I'm watching over here, but I, I know all of the other actions that are going on. Cause if I don't, I'm going to get killed. To give Darcy another plug. I think I, I had some serious tunnel vision issues until I went through Darcy. And then I realized how to, to how to stop having this tunnel vision, look at more that's going on. And now I'm, I, I respond to these critical incidents and I'm, able to pick up so much more and it's unbelievable. And it's, it's, it's really cool how that uh, stress inoculation actually wound up working and it yep. works in my favor today. Um, matter of fact, we had a discussion on a recent post on Facebook and I brought up something about weapon lights and I brought up, we, we had a, a guy at gunpoint suicidal dude. And I remember an officer was carrying an M three and his weapon light sucked ass. I wouldn't have noticed that had I not <laughs> had this, I'm seeing everything and I'm pulling it all in and I'm realizing that guy is ineffective. We need to do something to make up for his. Yeah. Such a cool concept. As a matter of fact, we can completely stay on this tangent. We don't need to circle back to anything before we do though. We probably should at least get some intros, but I think the, the discussion's off to an awesome start. And so no fail is just kind of bringing it back to like, hey man, what were you taught when you learned how to ride a bike? Having a flyer go on somewhere else is almost as serious as a little shot going on somewhere else. I think because I mean the original weapon lights that were issued were like what, 60 women or something like yep. that? Yeah. Hey everyone, Matt Lanford here with Primary and Secondary. Welcome to Modcast. Today is May 23rd, 2021. The episode number is 268. We're going to be discussing the practical application of the firearm safety rules. It's a bit of a mouthful. It's also something that on occasion we'll discuss. Um, and there are some interesting misconceptions with the rules. There's some interesting misconceptions of their applications. And we have an awesome panel to discuss this because... That's what we do. We discuss this kind of stuff. Then we, we ping um, professionals who are very good at very good and skilled and experienced in their fields to get their intake intake to get their insight. That's what I'm looking for. So before we start, big thanks to our sponsors, big, big thanks to big techs ordinance. So basically the way it works is, well, you know, that big techs company, they carry all kinds of stuff. Typically, when I'm when I need to order something from big techs, what I do is I put it, I submit all the stuff that I want to buy, but then I have to go line by line figuring out, okay, what else do I need? And typically my purchase ends up doubling in size and in price, if not tripling or quadrupling. Uh, big techs is run by some wonderful people, uh, friends of the whole network. Uh, these are guys that go out and train and they go out and participate. And what they're doing is they're selecting the products they carry are the things that people actually want. They're the things that work. It's a great company, great people. Uh, give them some love. Also, big thanks to Phil Strollsters, another company that is um, very um, involved in primary and secondary. Uh, John and Sarah provide wonderful products that are purpose built, that are very well thought of. Um, basically these guys are trend or these guys are setting the trends for the direction that we are going for, uh, when it comes to concealment, it's rather exciting to see the evolution of their products and the direction everything is going. So the Enigma, uh, for example, you have the non-light bearing Enigma and the light bearing Enigma. Basically what this is, is this is a pretty much a deep concealment holster chassis that you, you uh, add in your compatible holster and it, it's pants are, are optional. You don't even need to wear pants with these. What you have is a very concealed, very comfortable means of carrying. Even if you're not wearing a belt, if you're wearing sweatpants or scrubs or whatever. And for many people, they have found that the Enigma system is far more comfortable and more conducive to carry than carrying something on their waistline on their pants belt. So check it out if you haven't already. It's a really, really cool option. Works really well. Um, also, big thank you to uh, another sponsor, Primary Arms. So basically, Primary Arms has a 
ton of companies that are associated with primary and secondary. These are top of the line uh, products, top of the line companies. Um, as a matter of fact, I think I brought up their optics in a previous episode. And one of the panelists brought up the fact that they have one of their red dots that just refuses to die. If you haven't checked out primary arms, you probably need to. Um, another company, when you place an order, you might need to go item by item, list by list, category by category to make sure you're not missing anything because I personally can't stand placing an order and then realizing, oh crap, I needed to get lube or crap, I needed to get whatever magazines or whatever. Going item by item, make sure you, you don't miss anything. Um, additionally, what Primary Arms provides is if you happen to be a purchaser for an agency, uh, they have special government purchasing ability. So if you need to outfit your department with equipment, weapons, whatever, they have the ability to do that. And they have special programs for that. Speaking of special programs, uh, Staccato, another sponsor, um, some high-end governmental agencies are using the Staccato uh, P series pistols. I recently went through Scott Jedlinski's Red Dot Pistol class. It was, as a matter of fact, last weekend. Wonderful class. Hi highly, highly, highly recommend it. Um, if you're already a Red Dot shooter or if you're looking to go into Red Dot shooting or using a Red Dot, the nice thing about Scott's class is it is a wonderful mechanics and pistol shooting class that happens to also focus on a Red Dot. So if you're new to shooting a Red Dot, what a great opportunity to learn how to master it and maximize your capabilities with the Red Dot. So I used my Staccato XC in the class and it, basically the pistol was cheating. It... Uh, it was allowing me to shoot far better than I could with, say, my a stock Glock. Um, and this is something that we can put on a timer and I can show this is shooting better for me. I'm more accurate. I'm faster. Um, I also carry a stac uh, staccato on duty. Uh, and what I say at every, every time we bring up staccato pistols or 20 and 11s in general, they were intimidating to me. Uh, a single action, a 1911 style pistol was a bit intimidating because you have the manual safety. Um, the trigger is so much lighter, but with practice, with training, it isn't that big of a worry. And I'm at the point now where this is something that I can carry regularly without any concern. Um, if you don't want to be spending extra money on something like that, we happen to also have Walther Firearms. Walther Arms is a sponsor of the show. They came out with the PDP pistols. They now have, what are they, three, four different models right now. There's the compact, which is the four, what is it, four inch? the four five, the full size. And there's also kind of a uh, long grip, short, uh, short slide version. Awesome. Pistols. If you are looking to get a striker fired pistols pistol, if you're not already invested in a specific brand, or if you want to branch out that PDP is well worth your time. I've done side-by-side -side comparisons with the PDP versus the PPQ, which the PPQ is known to be an awesome shooter, but also probably the best factory trigger for a striker fired gun. The PDP is better. And this is my opinion, but this is what I found. And then when I compare notes with other people that have shot both, they're all leaning in the same direction. That PDP has a better trigger. It's an awesome pistol. As a matter of fact, I think it killed the PDP or the PPQ. Um, lastly, big thank you to our Patreon subscribers. If you go to patreon.com slash primary and secondary, you can help support the network. Um, with that include benefits. One of those benefits is a discount with our upcoming Training, uh, training summit in September, September 4th, 5th, and 6th. With this, I'm working on an ammo package where you can purchase ammo with your registration, which the ammo will be cheaper than what you can get it off shelves, store shelves right now. It's gonna be about pre-COVID pricing, so not rapey. I'm really excited about that. Uh, to give people an opportunity to train and they don't have to worry about their, their, their ammo stash is hugely important. As a matter of fact, going to Scott's class a week ago, um, wonderful, wonderful opportunity, wonderful training. Every single round we fired counted and it had a purpose, but it also was taking ammo out of people's ammo stores. So to be able to provide this ammo for my training summit, that is exciting. So I'm, I have five, five, six and nine, nine mil on the way. And I'll be able to provide packages for, for the registry, for the regist the people that are going to the class uh, as part of the registration. 
So super exciting. Uh, don't forget, we do have a website. Don't forget, we have a forum. Um, we have all these different channels on Facebook. Preferably go to the forum, though, because it's better. Um, but all these resources are here for you. And before I go any further, make sure you are supporting those sources that you have found to be beneficial. If you really like Lucky Gunner and the videos they provide, if you really like John Altman and his videos through uh, Filster and about concealment purposes, make sure you're following these companies on social media. Make sure you're liking, making, make sure you're subscribing. And that goes to primary and secondary stuff too. Make sure you're liking, subscribing, sharing, and all that kind of stuff. Because it's, it's not only is, is it appreciated, but it helps us out because unfortunately it's kind of currency. And it's something I say at every episode, but there are a lot of very popular sources of information that are providing bad info. And if you think about it, good info isn't determined by a democracy. So popularity doesn't necessarily mean it's good, but popularity sure helps with getting good information out. And that's the whole goal of what we do at primary and secondary. So um, I think with that, I believe we're going to start the show. So Matt, let's get some, intro let's get an intro on you. Okay. Um, my name is Matt Little. I run a training company called Graybeard Actual. There's a, a war story behind it that I shared on the show before already. Do it, so do it, I'll do let it. the guys look it up. Oh, do it. Uh, I'll, I'll let them look it up. They can Okay. okay. All right. All right. Well, I'll do the abbreviated version, right? So basically to sum it up, we were in a pretty involved tick in Afghanistan. We've been fighting for a couple of days and everything was said and done and we were about to leave and our interpreter picked up on the ICOMs that they were going to hit us again. Then they never showed up and the interpreter found out through the ICOM chatter that they'd given my team a street name because we were all old and wise or at least old. And we were the Greybeards, and they decided once they realized it was my team, they weren't going to hit us. Um, I was younger then. I wasn't, my beard wasn't gray yet, but our team sergeant, you know, our Fox, our, our team commander, everybody was towards the end of their, uh, their shelf life. <laughs> I was just talking to my team leader today, as a matter of fact. But um, it kind of, that story kind of was the, the inspiration behind the name, because the whole idea is that that's a natural progress. That's a natural evolution of a warrior. Once you're around long enough for your beard and your hair to turn gray, it's your job to pass on your lessons learned so the next generation can be better than you were. And that's the idea behind it. Um, you can find my training company it, on IG. I'm graybeard underscore actual. It's graybeardactual.com on the internet. And you can spell gray either way because I bought both URLs. So you could be nice. Um, I also work for uh, Staccato, where I do law enforcement and military demonstrations and classes for them. And apart from that, I'm just enjoying retirement. And I'm loving uh, spending all my time on ranges with people that like to shoot and in mm -hmm. shoot houses with cops that like to be better at CQP. Heck yeah. And we're going to do some stuff in July. Yes, definitely. definitely. Cool. Kurt. Uh, my name is Kurt Weber. I'm a retired Special Forces guy. Uh, Spent most of my career in the in the SIF Commander's Extremist Force. Um, now I'm, now I'm a, a lackey for the State Department. I work as a contract instructor for any terrorism program. Cool. How I many years for you? Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I didn't realize. I said, I guess I should have put my background in there as well. I usually do. Um, I spent a dual career. I was in 20th Special Forces Group, which is a part-time unit. And I was also with Chicago <laughs> PD, where I ran the training for the SWAT team. So I'll stop interrupting, Kurt. I'll go back to That's you. That's okay. And how many years do both of you have under your belt with either military law enforcement or both? 33. Uh, I did 22 years in the Army and 15 years as a contractor. And you build a lot of buildings and schools and things as a contractor? Pretty much. Yeah. I build, I, build, I build people. He That's builds right. skill sets. <laughs> That's right. Okay, before we were rudely interrupted by those intros, where were we? We we're talking about some really cool stuff, talking about uh, processor speed and also how that relates to ultimately safety. So um, why don't we start out with the overall, the, the safety rules themselves and how they apply to real life. Either of you want to take that? Um, right. I'll take... I can take the first one unless you want to, Kurt. Go. I'm going to take the first one. All right. So historically, this has been all guns are always loaded is the way it was first told to me, right? I don't like that at all. 
Um, I think that implies a contempt for the person you're giving the rules to, like they're not intelligent enough mm. to check the status of their gun. So what I tend to say is treat all guns as if they were loaded at all times and always be aware of the status of your weapon. I mean, the you second always... part, yeah. I'll, I, I'll change that a little bit. I, when I'm explaining it to a new class is I tell them that the, the guns are always loaded unless it's in your hand and you've, and you've cleared it. Now, as long as it's in your hand and it's clear, it's clear. Once it leaves your hand for any reason, it's not. When you pick it back up, clear it, treat it like it's loaded because you don't know. Yep, I like that. <clears throat> that actually was a point of contention a few years ago talking about the status of a weapon and people talking about, well, it's always loaded. And I would explain, yes, it may be always loaded, but when I take it off, I may have unloaded it to dry fire or something and I forgot to load it again. I need to, as Matt just said, I need to be aware of the status. So I might need to reload. Amazing. Well, or, the, or picking it up out of a case. So we, we yes. had a guy shot. Uh, team came back from a trip. Guns are in a box. Guy's taking the gun out of the box. Sees that the, the rifle is, is cocked and on semi. So he pulls the trigger, fires, shoots the guy next to him. It's like, well, everyone just assumed that it went into the box drive, but yeah. obviously it didn't. You know, that was two, the two loudest sounds in the world for anybody that carries a gun for a living are bang when you expected click and click when you really need bang. Yep. And, and you've got to make sure you know the status for both of those. It's not just, like you said, it's not just enough to say, well, I'll treat it as if it's loaded. If I pick it up and I assume that it's loaded, I may have a dead man's gun. So I, I think it's an important distinction yeah. to make. You know? yeah. So you know, check. I, that's, that's how you find out. You check. Yeah. And, and exactly. And I, I think that's where uh, press checks come in. And a lot of people are against the press check. They think it's important to. I'm, I'm one. Okay. Uh, yeah. Some people say, yeah, just rack it to, to make sure it's loaded. I, I personally, I'm partial to the press check. Um, it, it was uh, as part of our school at Sephardic in the excuse me in the at the end of the marksmanship phase there's a marksmanship evaluation before the students can start doing live fire cqb and uh one of the one of the things they have to do is there's a, a, several separate tests that they're just they're, they're measures of functional skill and one of the things that that was common is almost every class if, if a student induces a malfunction if he causes a malfunction in an otherwise working gun, he does not get a reshoot or a do-over. It's he gets what he gets. And every single class, we dropped a student because a press check left a weapon not in a fireable condition because either the slide didn't go all the way forward or the bolt didn't go all the way forward or, you know, whatever he did, his loading procedure worked. He loaded his weapon correctly and then he caused it to be unloaded when he needed it to shoot. Oh, wow. And, and, you know, it, the amount of money that's invested in training those guys is, is huge. And to send a guy home because he induced a malfunction doing a press check when his gun was working, all he had to do is follow the loading procedures, load them and, and go. And he, and he did. And I was, I was one of those things. It's like, it's, it's out of my hands. I mean, it's black and white. If he can't pass, he can't, he can't move on. Oh, that's an awesome consideration. And I don't know, I mean, and all, all due respect, believe me, Kurt, absolutely. I just, I, I do like the press check. I just think you have to make sure to ensure that it's in battery afterwards. It's one of those things, it's like, it's like everything else. You know, your, your experience drives your, your box. The, nobody thinks outside their box because your box is the sum total of your experience. You know, my, my is, mine is different than other guys. And so, you know, how I process and perceive things is based on my prior experience with them. And that's, that's just one of those things is it was, you know, it's, it's tough trying to explain to a commander, why did my guy fail? Well, your guy failed because he did this. And it's like, well, that's BS. And I'm like, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I don't, I don't disagree. However, he did it and he's, he's going home. Yeah. And that's that just one of those things that stuck with me. That kind of goes back also to a post I made today in primary and secondary talking about 
let's see here, hard and fast standards, bleeding edge, tip of the ice or tip, the tip of the spear, uh, capability or products, and then find the balance in the middle. That is a hard and fast rule. It's, yeah. it's good to know. Yeah. I was, I was trying to stay out of that one because you and I disagree about lights. Oh, that's okay. No, that's, that's the best part about this, though. We can disagree and we can have a, 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 good, a good discussion about it. Unlike almost any other part of American society in 2021. Yes. Yeah. But we just disagreed about press checks. But you brought up an awesome uh, example that I'm going to bring up next time it's next time anyone brings it up. Yep. And I'm actually I'm actually awesome. going to use that to reinforce the habit of ensuring that the slide of the bolt is completely in battery. Because, I mean, yeah, I can see a definite issue there. And there's been times where I've press checked my gun and I've, you know, and if I hadn't pushed on the rear of the slide, it wouldn't have been in battery. Yeah. It's, it's always part of my habit. I always tap the rear of the slide. Tap it, tap, tap. Um, rule two. Rule two. But rule before two. that, um, also that kind of goes with something that I, I, I figured out not too long ago. And it's, you know, having, having disagreements perfectly fine because it's an opportunity for me to better understand the other side of my perspective. Perfect example right here. Even though it's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> not nearly as wrong as my TLR7. Oh, I hate the TLR7. No, I have two of them. And I have a six, and I hate that even more. Uh, yeah, the six is six. I won't put on a gun, but I have a couple of sevens. Yeah, I have them just for whatever demo, demo purposes. But man, what a letdown! It, it works for what I need it to do. Yeah, for when you're in the bathroom and the lights go out, just short, turn on the short light. Short range. And... I, I don't have two hands to work. Uh, I, I'm short enough that concealing an X three hundred is problematic because, like, yeah. I I can't put one in my pants and sit down. The but not I can with the TLR seven. Not gonna, not gonna I'm not six, go there because I'm not six foot five like some people. Hey, yeah, that's only I, one of us here. I'm close. I'm almost there. You got me by a little bit. If you drink milk. Yeah. If I keep if I keep drinking milk, maybe one day I can be as tall as Matt Landfair. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> um, rule two. Matt, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Kurt. Your turn. I did. Um, like all of the rules, one, one of the things in like t teaching these to the guys I work with or to the guys I'm teaching now is difficult because they don't, they don't associate, they're not culturally associated. So they don't see the act of pointing a gun at somebody as a contributing cause of when the malfunction or when the accident happened, that it caused him to get shot. But if you just pointed the gun somewhere else, then that guy wouldn't have ended up with a bullet in his leg. Um, so it's like, you know, the, the rules, almost all safety accidents, this is again, going back to my, my time as, as an accident reviewer, is accidents are cumulative events. It's very rarely a single point failure. It's almost always multiple things happen that led to the end result. And, you know, point, not pointing the gun at, at places where you don't want the gun pointed or where you don't want things shot it's not a problem if you thought that the gun was loaded, you picked it up and you cleared it. And now you're pointing it at a place in a direction that's unsafe. But if you didn't do the first one and now you do the second one, you've just compounded your safety error. And that's, you know, all, all four of those old rules, they, they work on each other. And sometimes, you know, failing in one of them is enough to cause, you know, the, the bad result. And sometimes it's not. Sometimes those other ones can piggyback on there and, and keep you safe. But like, that's one of the big ones. If your gun's not pointed where somebody's going to get hurt, if there is an accident and there is an accident, then you can laugh about it afterwards. It's a, it's a funny event. Somebody's bringing a case of beer to the team room. You know, if, if you're old enough that you were allowed to have beer in your team rooms. Um, uh, uh, but if, if you're not, if you're pointing that gun someplace where it really, really shouldn't go and there's an accident, Nope, nobody laughs. It's it's no longer funny. And just like you said, I, I the fact that they interlace, it's it's a good set to follow. Yeah, there's redundancy built in. Yeah, you, you have to you have to break multiple rules for really bad things to happen. This is the one. So, slight tangent, but still on rule two, if that's okay. Yeah. This is the one that kind of makes me a little crazy sometimes when I teach. 
and it's not what I see most often, what I see is the most often violation of this rule in the circles I travel in is not somebody flagrantly waving the gun around. It's not somebody manipulating a gun behind the shooting line like they shouldn't be, right? Not somebody looking at their buddy's gun and it's muzzling somebody across the range. It's the guy that turns in a smoking run on a drill or exercise. And as he's holstering up, because he wants to drop the mic and look good to his buddies, he turns as he holsters and the gun sweeps people. And I see guys that are otherwise completely safe and cognizant of that gun doing that at that moment. It, this, it's such a big thing that I have to give a special like little lecture about it every class to make sure people don't do it. Scott Zidlinski had to do that a couple yeah. times. Guys that are otherwise totally competent will do that. Yeah. And it's just because they're excited that they did so well. You know, and their finger's not on the trigger. They're not intentionally being stupid. They're not, they're not being grossly negligent. They're just so excited they forget to holster, to finish holstering before they turn around. They turn as they're holstering. That goes back to that cognitive overload. Yep. Yes, it so does. They got overwhelmed in that moment. Yep. Did you guys see the post yesterday from Centrifuge Training, Will Petty? And it talks about this, and I think this would be a good discussion. Uh, firearms instructors, this is what they're saying. Safety, be, safety brief, be like, never point your muzzle at anything you're not willing to destroy. Also, firearms instructors, I want you to sue the shit out of, you, out of your femoral and partners. Muzzling happens in real life. Lower calf, calf sweeps are, acceptables, are acceptable. Uh, sets up drill where students are shooting at depth for training purposes allows sloppy CQB with flagrant flagging then it goes on i think it's a, that's a that's a good point so i'm not a big believer in the overuse of sewell mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons one is you can't move athletically with both your hands tucked into your chest like that sewell was designed for specific instances and there are times where it's a very good position but if i'm running and gunning i'm never in sewell mm -hmm. and even though i teach you know, primarily CCW and law enforcement people in my classes, when they move up range, I do not permit the temple index. I don't permit Sewell. The muzzle stays down range following the 180 rule. And I give a little speech about how that may seem artificial, but then I go into my reasons why. And I go into how all of these different positions can apply in the real world. But you need to have the ability to pick and choose the proper response in the real world for your environment, for the tactical situation, for what's going on. And I give a, an example of like, you know, if you're running towards someone that you intend to shoot or that you may need to shoot, you handle the gun one way. But what if you're running towards them and there's a kindergarten recess behind them, right? You don't really want to be pointing the gun at them. You need to be moving in a way that's still athletic, that allows you to move rapidly, but without muzzling the kids. And there's ways to do that, but running in Sewell, that little SWAT crouch tip, tap, tip, tap run is not the way to do it. And like where I see Sewell mostly with, with the instructors, because students don't ever, they don't know it, is in crowded places. And like, to, to me, that's the worst place to do it because it's so easy to disarm somebody if they've got that second hand off the gun. You, you just, if you've only got one hand controlling your weapon, it's really easy for someone to turn around and take that gun away from. You. And if you're moving, you know, in, in tight conditions with your teammates, tight around other people, and one of the guys you bump into wants your stuff, he's taking it from you. Well, I think this also goes back to, well, it's, it's a training level, training issue. Um, if you're unable to what, have that unconscious competence to know where potential, where things shouldn't be pointed at are and immediate control of the muzzle, yeah. it's something that you probably should be working on. And I think part of the problem is people want these static positions right? yeah. that are kind of contrived and, and over exaggerated. It's, and I come from a martial arts background when I was young, right? So you see this in like classical martial arts these positions that are based on something that has value in conflict, but have become very, very artificial, very contrived. Um, I think it was Bruce Lee that said, you know, there's dead techniques and alive techniques, you know, techniques that still have life in them. They're still flexible yeah. and adaptable. 
And all these positions, you don't need these like static contrived, overly tense positions. If you train enough and put yourself in enough situations where you're moving with a firearm around obstacles and other human beings, and you're cognizant of where the muzzle is pointed, where your finger is, all of these factors, retention factors like Kurt talked about, you can be fluid and adaptable and have the gun in a place where you're meeting all the safety requirements and still tactically sound without trying to lock into some stiff position that's only gonna make you move less well and yeah. react more slowly. It, like in, in, in a CQB environment, the, the low ready. If you, if you run around in the low ready, you're gonna be pointing the end of your pistol or a rifle at, at either your teammate's lower back or lower leg. So, you know, low ready is great if you're all online and all facing a line of targets 25 yards away from you. But in a moving, in, in the moving environment of CQB where people aren't static and you're constantly moving, that's not safety. Being in the low ready isn't a safe position. Following that second rule of, hey, my teammate's moving in front of me, let me move my barrel out of his way. So I'll move my barrel here. Now that's safe. Okay, now he's over there. I can point my barrel in a different direction and it's safe. I think this whole discussion is reinforcing the need for people to get off the square range. Not, not purely get off the square range that it's horrible, but you need to get in some practical three-dimensional shoot house or similar force on force to get a feel for how to apply things on the fly. Because in my opinion, one of the parts of mastery is just that applying techniques on the fly with fluidity without having to think about it. Again, bringing up Darcy, when we're stacking up, depending on where you are in the stack, it might be more beneficial to have your gun straight up. If you're third man in the stack, straight up works really well because you're faster on getting the gun out when the two guys in front of you split off into different directions. But that's also... That's experience and processing and all that rolled into one. But again, with fluidity, um, if you just do everything square range in a sterile environment, how are you going to know how to go around furniture? We're, we're going into a room and, hey, there's a couch right there. Why do, I've never done that before. I need to go against the wall. So, yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's that's where the, 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 the essence of, it, that's why experience is so important. That's why, you know, people, the Facebook people all the time are like, well, you know, where did you learn to shoot? I, I was watching YouTube. I'm like, okay, but where did you learn? Well, I, I watched some YouTube videos. I'm like, that's not learning. That That's, that's entertainment. watching, that, that's watching a video. Yeah. That's yeah. That's entertainment. That's not teaching you. That's not an instructor watching you shoot and evaluating your skills, seeing your weaknesses and giving you methods to improve them. That's what, that's what teaching does. So go do that. Oh, oh, but I thought if I watch this guy shoot, I'm like, yeah, actually he doesn't shoot that way either because his video is highly edited because he shot the same drill 50 times yeah. to get one perfect run. Instructor zero. <clears throat> that may or may not be Butkin. <clears throat> replayed at, at live speed because you don't know. That's wait, wait a minute. Why is the smoke moving so quickly? Why is the, it's... why is the magazine dropping so fast? Why are the, why is the shrubbery moving so quickly? My gravity doesn't work that way. Yeah, what? It's, but yeah, to me, to actually get good instruction means I get to learn how to apply things. And there's not, and my favorite thing with the best instructors I've ever been to have said, this is a way, or these are some of the ways. There is no the way. I think there are universal principles. Yes. But this is one of the reasons why trying to learn from video is so problematic, right? Is that the principles are universal, but technique by definition has to be adapted to your physiology and your psychology, your yes. environment, your ROE, everything else that's going on, right? A really good example of how like physical and mental attributes affect the proper execution of technique. Um, let's talk about grip, just grip, right? Yeah. The principles of grip on a pistol are universal, right? But if they're universal, take a good look at all the top shooters' grips. Latham, Steger, Vogel, all of these guys, their grip looks different. It looks different because they figured out how to use those principles for their hand size, for their strength, for their structure, even their psychology. And like, look at all the top athletes from anything we do. 
there's a wide range of individual variation in the way technique looks. But if you have an educated eye, you can see that the constant is the principles that make the technique correct, right? Yeah. And I think that we tend to lose sight of that as shooters and as tacticians. We, we lose sight of the fact that we need to realize that, yes, the principles are the same, but I've got to do enough repetition and study and be objectively self-evaluating and figure out how to make all these things work for my frame, my psychology, my physiology work for me, right? And I think that applies to CQB as well. If you look at like, I mean, the principles are the same, right? And if you do an army style CQB, you wind up, your points of domination are gonna be the same for each particular environment. But look at the individual movement skills of the guys you know that are really, really good at that, you know? Um, you know, you take, uh, take Tom Spooner, take, um, take some of the other guys that have just like done countless and countless hours of CQB. And if you look at the way they move, if your eye is educated, you can see that they're following the same principles, but everybody has individual variation in their technique. And imitating somebody, just the way their, their technique appears, doesn't mean you're actually understanding what makes that technique work. Sorry, it's, that's a tangent, I know. I love the idea of understanding why you're doing something, because if you don't, you're not educated. How, how do you do this? How do you have this fluidity if you don't understand why you're going to do something? And how do you choose what's best unless you understand Ex it? Experience. Yeah. Ex experience yeah. is the only teacher that works in, in the end. I mean, you, you know, it go, again, going back to my state, not going back to my state job. One of the hard things I have teaching new instructors is to shut up and let the students do things. Stop explaining what you want them to do and let them do it. Because the more you talk, the less they do. And experience will teach them that they're doing it wrong. And you can give them a knowledge base. You can start them from a, an, as elevated a position as you can give them, but eventually they need to reach up and grab it for themselves. And the only thing that will do that is, is doing it. And the more time they spend not doing it, doing other things, the harder it's going to be in the end for them to actually learn that skill. Hey, Rev, go, you know, it go ahead. goes back to that cognitive overload, right, Kurt? Like I, I figured out early on, you know, like way before I had my training coming, like back, you know, teaching for SF, teaching martial arts when I was a kid, that if I gave people too many corrections at any one time, everything just ground to a stop. Like they can't fix that many things at once. You've got to pick the low hanging fruit and give them one, maybe if they're really on top of their game, maybe two or three things and anything more than that. And you're going to bring the train to a halt. It's yeah. not going to keep progressing. And that was a hard lesson for me to learn because you want to fix everything. That corner. Yeah. And uh, again, okay. Another Darcy thing <sighs> that rich Mason. Um, one of the things I learned early on as an assistant instructor was to determine when I'm allowing a learning moment or having a teaching opportunity and watching people on the catwalk, okay, at what point do, am I going to say, hey, you might want to do this or let them fail and learn for themselves. And that was a really cool um, epiphany for me to determine, okay, what's, what's providing the most amount of benefit for the students? Because who cares? I, it's, I'm, the, I'm, I'm one of the instructor guys. It doesn't matter for me. But for the, for the students, what's going to be most beneficial? So should I shut up and let them fail or should I speak up and everyone gets to learn? Um, that's, that was a, a really, really cool thing for me to, to, to learn uh, in real time. So should we move to number three? Well, I think we should probably move to number three. Okay. The old number three. All right. So turn over the order. Be aware of your targets three, right? And four is nope. finger or the other way around. All right, so we'll go with target. So classically, it's be aware of your target. Then later on, it get added into be aware of your target and it's a backstop, right? And then foreground and, too. Well, I, I'll go eat one even better is I like target background, foreground, and its surroundings yeah. because that starts getting people to try to think about opening up their vision, yeah. opening up their awareness, rather than just be tunnel visioned on their target, their lane. I wanted to start at least having secondary awareness of the other things going on. What are your thoughts, Kurt? I, I teach it slightly different. Um, 
I, I teach, and, and this is, no, it's, that's number four. Okay, uh, I got it backwards. <laughs> the, but th- thinking in the, in, the, in the progression, you know, and, and these things stacking on each other is I have to know what my target is, but I also have to know what's all the way around it. Is, you know, are my teammates, are there no shoots? Are, is the, the reason that I'm in that building, is, is it right next to the guy I want to shoot? Then I, I may want to take more care. But also in the, from teaching civilians, is, is it right to shoot? A- am I doing the right thing by shooting now? Um, because that's part of that identifying the target. And you skip, that's what flat, one of the dangers of flat range training is you skip that decision making. And in reality, you know, from, a, from a, either a military or a civilian standpoint, shooting is a lot about, in a, in a defense or offensive role, shooting is a lot about decision-making. Am I right to shoot that person at that moment? So, you know, to me, that's part of identifying your target is, is one, knowing what your target is and what's around it, but also why am I shooting at it? If I'm on the flat range, it's because I'm, I'm trying to work on a skill. If I'm in the shoot house, it's because... I want to prevent him from shooting me or my teammates. If it's, you know, if, if it's, I'm on the street, it's to prevent somebody from doing something to my wife. All, all of those decision-making factors wrap up into that. I think and the I, fact that you, oh, the, the fact that you brought up the square range, I, I think is wonderful because most people are thinking only in that and they're not considering, well, if I'm in a team environment, where are my teammates? Is there a possibility of them walking in front of me while I'm shooting? Or if we're out in public, is there a possibility of a vehicle or a person getting in in the way? Or is that person walking or are they moving in a manner where they're going to be using people as cover? But yeah, square range. No, we're, there's the one target. I don't have to worry about navigating anything. That's the only thing I need to worry about. Matt. Well, and, and the safety rules apply regardless. It doesn't matter if you're on the flat range or the two-way range, right? Yeah. And it's, I think that that, and by the way, I'm going to add the little piece about PID to the speech I give about that rule, by the way. I'm stealing that from you, Kurt, because that, that I, I is stole, a good I'm place. I'm sure I stole it from somebody else. That is a good place to put that in. I like that because I do already talk about, you know, yeah, you've decided to service this guy, but you need to be aware of the environment because someone could panic and run between you and the guy who's shooting at you that you're shooting at. And you have to be aware of these things before they enter your sight picture, right? So I'm going to throw in the PID in there as well because you can't hit that too many times. Who, who's so, who's thanks, the one Kurt, Israeli that got shot? The, the one Israeli hostage that got shot during Uganda. The one that stood up and ran. Time. The one that ran. Yeah, right? ran, ran, ran at the assaulters because they thought yep. they were being rescued. Yep. That didn't work. Nope. Any more on three? Or well, four. It's, it's really four. It's really yeah. four. Yeah, that was my fault. Okay, should we go back to three now? Back we should three. go back to three now. Finger off the trigger. I mean, this is like this is like the where you see ninety nine percent of the failures in gun accidents is finger on the trigger because yep. you know what I tell my students is guns are mechanical devices that they don't ma- magic doesn't affect them very much, so very they don't. Much. They, they don't go on their own. Now, I, we, we had a, a – the, when I worked at Sephardic, the sniper school is, is co-located with us, and they had an accidental discharge in their course, and they were trying to replicate it. And a uh, bolt-action rifle went off inside of a sniper's drag bag that they used on their stocks. Was it a Remington 700? Yes. Hmm. Uh, a, a Remington 700 type. Yeah. Um, but the, the way the, the condition of the gun going into the back was magazine loaded in, in the gun, but no, no uh, round in the chamber. And somehow inside the bag, the bolt operated, the gun came off safe and the trigger fired. Um, and eventually they were able to replicate. Uh, and, and we saw that, yes, it actually is possible for all of those things to happen and magic did affect that gun, but it's really, really rare. All the other times guns goes off, it's because something hit the trigger. And you had a usually guy, it's your finger. Remember when the M4s first came out and they would cook off if you shot them on full yep. auto too much? We were doing a, a break and contact drill, and this was before 9 11. 
And one of our guys dropped to a knee to throw a grenade in the breaking contact drill. And the gun cooked off and shot his calf. And he was so determined that we all knew that it wasn't an ND. Like his calf is blown up and he's got his hands up. He's like, it's unsafe. My hands weren't even touching it. It's unsafe. My hands were like, it's okay, dude. We all saw it. Sit down and elevate your leg. No, no, I'm serious. My, it's unsafe. My finger wasn't on the trigger. We all saw it. It's okay. Let's let's get a tourniquet on that thing. Yeah. Like that's how that's how the culture is, you know. Um, I like uh, I like telling people to find a physical reference point on the side of the frame of the gun, so they have something to kind of program their subconscious into. And um, at what point do you teach people, Kurt, that it's okay to start prepping the trigger, to put your finger on the trigger? This is one of those experience thing with 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 people because like finger goes on the trigger for me. Finger goes on the trigger when I've made the decision to shoot. And so that somewhere in the presentation of bringing the gun out from wherever it was to where I wanted to end up somewhere in between there, the, my fingers going on because as you know, I'm, I'm bringing the gun out because I've made that conscious decision. So knowing that the decision, once I've got the, the gun up barrel pointed in the direction of the target, now it's a matter of finding my sights or refining my sights somewhere in that process, my fingers going on. Um, Prepping the trigger is, and man, it depends on the type of gun that you're shooting. Well, I, the the I, type of more, more of a more of a generic, more of a generic. I, I meant more putting the finger on the trigger and getting prepared to make the shot. So not yeah, so, yeah, so, not necessarily not necessarily a true prep and press. That's not really what I meant. Just getting yeah, the so, finger so, on there. Somewhere in the in the final presentation, um, but for us we call it in between, like in between position three and four. So it's somewhere out of the holster, the gun's pointed forward and it's starting to move in the direction of the target. So my barrel is pointed in the safe direction. It's pointed towards the guy I want to shoot, but I'm, now I'm just working sights and, and my sights I'm working on, you know, out to my final position. I've been trying to refine how I talk about this and kind of the current stage it's in and it may still get refined further. I, I, hopefully it does. I don't think I'm done growing yet as an instructor, but. I try to give people the concept that if they're visually connected to something they are going to shoot with the gun, doesn't mean they have to have the sights lined up yet, but if they're seeing the gun in their periphery and they know the gun is aimed at that target, they may not have a good hit yet, but it's, you know, towards that target, they can start putting the finger on the trigger. Even like transitions, right? So if you set up like an El Prez array where your targets are a yard apart and 10 yards away, I'm definitely okay with the finger staying on the trigger between those targets because there's nothing else in between those that doesn't need to get serviced. And you're seeing, you can see the other target already as you're transitioning the gun. So you're already visually connected to it. But if say it's a wide transition, say it's like a 120 degree, 180 degree transition, then that finger should come off the trigger because there's an extended period of time where you're not connected to a target through that gun. So you should be off the trigger. And That's one of the kind of, one of kind of the impetus behind this way of looking at it was I do a barricade drill where guys are intentionally close up on the barricade and have to maneuver the weapon around the barricade. It has a lot of benefits for everything from CQB to self-defense in tight quarters, right? The ability to run that gun. And unlike target transitions without that physical barrier in place, you have to get your finger off the trigger because if you hit that barricade because you're in close quarters to it, you could have an ND from hitting the barricade, right? And the difference there is that you're not visual, even though the target is so close, you're not visually connected to it until you come around that barricade. So fingers got to come off the trigger. And it just seemed like a good way to kind of conceptualize when it's okay to have the finger on the trigger and when it's not. And um, I'd actually really like to hear your thoughts on this one, Kirk, because it's kind of, I've been trying to figure out a way to give one principle to people that will enable them to understand when they're good and when they're not. That's cool. Yeah, I, I, you know, again, for me, it's, it's, I've made that conscious decision to shoot. My gun is oriented at the target. So worst case scenario, my gun fires early. And, and this is where, you know, to, to go back to the prepping the trigger, this is where you see a lot of failures with prepping the trigger is guys are pulling the trigger here and not fully extended. If you pull the trigger early, are you still going to get a hit? Uh, it, it might be a, you know, a C zone hit or a D zone hit, but are you still getting a hit on your target? Then you were probably in the position where your fingers should go on the trigger. And now depending on 
type of gun, type of trigger, can you start prepping that trigger? Can you start working the slack? Can I go to the wall? Uh, can I go, you know, to my wall and slightly farther forward in that final presentation where now I'm just refining sights. Now I'm just ma I'm making my hit better. I'm not changing that I, that I would have a hit. I'm just making the hit better. But my finger's on that trigger the whole time. I think this goes back also to our earlier discussion about processor speed, because a lot is going on. And if you don't have that stress inoculation, and if you're in a situation where you are absolutely stressed out, threats in front of you, they've presented themselves, they are going to kill you. And that's all you're focusing on. And you're not thinking about the whole process or you don't, you can't be on autopilot with the whole process. How are you going to perform? Yeah. Um, what you guys are discussing, Jed Linsky has a wonderful process and a wonderful explanation for both your presentation and target transition, which happen to be both related. And it's, I'm not going to say anything about it because I know Kurt, you're going to go to his class, but really, really well done. Very cool stuff. And he has you apply it uh, multiple, multiple times. Um, that's good stuff. It's, it's a good class. I think I've done it three times now. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, maybe four. You know, I, I, tend to, I tend to train with my friends a lot. Yeah. That, that's uh, like the bad thing about my job is I'll, I'll be lined up to do a class and a contract comes in and yeah. in, in my line of work, it, when work becomes available, you go. The, if you say no very often, then your phone stops ringing. Yeah. Are you busy uh, in September 4th, 5th yes. and 6th? Oh, figures. Cause you could have gone to Scott's is his bite size class. And then go with Matt and then with everyone else. Uh, I'm, I'm currently scheduled. It happens. Yeah. I think okay. he's looking at his calendar. No, oh. I'm, I'm looking at my calendar right now. <laughs> yep. No, we'll do it again next year. Kind of thinking of maybe having this twice a year, but we'll see. Um, so, so those are the I, rules though. Yeah. I, I have a question for Kurt or for you too, actually. What are the most common errors you have seen in a training environment that lead to a ballistic incident where somebody fires the gun? Overload. It's overload on the, uh, on the student. Yeah. The, I, I, I think you might've missed it. The, when I started reviewing accidents, um, you, you should stock wide. The, the two common denominators to accidents were student cognitive overload and instructor fatigue. Um, the, you know, that just because from an instructor standpoint, if, if you're tired, you're not going to stop the student when he makes a mistake. Uh, what, you'll be, what about the actual errors, though? Like the actual, like this is the physical almost, error that was done. Almost, like, like holstering up is a big one. Uh, al almost all relate like the common denominator was cognitive overload is that the, the student is overwhelmed in a technique. So he, he's not at that, uh, the unconscious mastery he's, he's at, at, he's consciously walking through a process and his physical actions start to outpace his ability to conceptualize and describe the event to himself. So the guy's got to holster the pistol. He's, a new student is going to tell himself, I need to put my pistol on safe. I need to take my finger out of the trigger. I'm going to bring the muzzle of my gun down to my holster. I'm going to find the, the opening of my holster. I'm going to push the gun down until it seats. I, I don't need to think about that. I know all those steps. But if you're consciously trying to talk yourself through those steps, you're going to miss one of them because you can you can move a lot faster than you can talk. And, and that's where students, I mean, that's what, what I mean by the cognitive overload is that they're they're mentally trying to talk themselves through a process that they don't yet have unconscious mastery of. And so that, that step slows them down and they're, they're physically moving faster than they can mentally describe a process. I can tell you a technique that will do the opposite and make them freeze up pinning the trigger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Still taught in Utah post. Well, that one makes me a little, I don't know if I should say it or not. I'm going to say should. it. You should. I'm going to say it anyway. I, I may upset some people, but that's okay. That one bugs me almost as much as the temple index. I'll just leave that alone. 
Well, I see, I see an application of the temple index and I would use it if I'm put in a specific scenario, but similar to Sewell, it's not something that I'm always going to be going and doing. There are better things for me, depending on the situation that I'm in. Uh, yeah, I, and but I, I can find a specific example of where I, I will pin the trigger. If, if, I'm yeah, shooting, yeah. if I'm shooting a pistol at 50 yards, I, I, I'm going to do everything as slow as I possibly can. And that includes letting off, letting yep. off the, the, the trigger yep. after the gun goes off. And what I'm just saying is having that it's, as the technique yeah, for it's, everything. It, it, it's again, it's ex it, it, experience is that yep. the, the teacher that can't be substituted. Cause if, if you know when you should do it, then it will make sense to do it. And if you don't, then it's never going to make sense. And see, I'd argue Kurt that what you're doing isn't really the same thing as the pen and reset because what you're doing is you're doing so deliberate. There's, I think there's three paces to shooting, right? You have deliberate, reactive, and predictive. And when you're doing a deliberate pace, what I would argue you're doing, Kurt, is not pinning the trigger and then waiting for that audible reset. You're simply yeah. doing every component task yeah. that is part of that skill in as meticulous a fashion as possible. And that causes you to reset the trigger slower than the slide is going to return to battery. But that doesn't mean that you're pinning it and waiting for the slide to return to battery. It's a yeah. small difference, but I think that difference matters. I agree. Yeah. You know, and I think that the people that did the pin and reset were trying to imitate what really good shooters like you do when you're shooting really difficult shots. But they didn't understand that rather than replicating the principle behind it, they're just replicating the appearance of it. I think one of, the grip. one of the aspects that seems to be so missed with that also is the, the, the time and distance to the threat and the amount of time you should be using to process and go through the whole shot process. So if my threat is five, five meters away, five feet away, I'm not, I should not be doing a very deliberate shot, but that's not taught at least in the Academy. No, and it, it really wasn't taught to us either. Um, Mer Merle Eddington, who's a professional shooter. He was on the army marksmanship unit uh, as a, uh, USPSA guy. And then he came and he worked with us at, at Sephardic and he was watching me shoot. And we were talking about shooting the Beretta. And, uh, I said, yeah, my finger, if I'm in close to the target, my finger comes all the way off the trigger. I will hit the front of the trigger guard. And if you know how big the trigger guard is on a Beretta to make your finger hit the front of it, that's, that's a long way off because I'm all the way on and all the way off. If I'm, you know, if I'm shooting at close, that to me that I, I can work the trigger much faster that way if I'm just holding the gun stable and yanking it as hard, yanking the trigger as hard as I can. You're not going to induce trigger freeze by doing that though, or trigger fingers no. freeze. So that's a good thing. So it's a good thing. Because trigger as long freeze as, is bad. And as long as you have a good support hand grip, the shots are still going to go exactly yeah, where at, you want at, them to. At close range, if you're holding the gun stable, I, you know, this is one of those, Trigger, trigger control is a shooting fundamental. And it's like, well, if your gun is stable, it doesn't matter how fast or how hard. The, what matters is that it's stable enough that how fast and hard didn't cause it to move. It, so, you know, those, those two things are related. So conversely, we go to that 50 yard shot and what's your trigger? What's your trigger finger doing? Slow. Yeah. And it's really hard for me because I am, I am not go a fast? patient shooter. Oh yeah, yeah I want to go same. fast. I, I want I want to do three yard sniping. Yep. Matt, how about you? As far as which, as far as the more difficult shots, both, uh, both. So, the truly difficult shots, like, become a really deliberate process for me. So like basically it's establish your structure and your grip first. And then once those are established, then I can move on to the next component task Then I'm gonna align the sights, whether it's my dot on the target or my iron sights. And then breathe. Well, you, you just don't stop breathing. Oh, okay. yeah, the important thing is to not forget to breathe. Okay. Right? And then once the sights are established and I have just the natural arc of movement and it's acceptable, then I'll start working the trigger. Just like, just like Kurt said, very, very deliberately for the most difficult of shots. But something that I'm playing around with, even with that right now is, so 
even shooting deliberately, if you eliminate all of the dead space, all of the lag time between these component tasks, you can pick up the pace quite a bit, even with a deliberate shot. So the idea is that you want to be working the trigger smoothly. You don't want to change the speed of the trigger working, but it doesn't have to be glacially slow either. And the idea is that once the sights are correct, I'm going to allow for the natural arc of movement, unless there's an error where I have to reset, I'm going to smoothly, but kind of with a sense of urgency, work the trigger through the process, right? And it's, the whole idea is to, even the ones that need to be the maximum amount of care taken, people still, they still tend to have a lot of dead time in their shooting, a lot of time where they're not doing anything. And the idea is you never want to rush this part of it. You want to take as much care as you need for the shot you have. Same thing with the sights. You want the sights to be as precise as they need to be for the shot you have. People overestimate both the care you need to take with this and the precision on the sights, especially as you get better and you have a better index and natural point of aim and better structure and all that stuff, right? In relation to the distance as well. In relation to the distance as well. But people have a tendency to both overthink their sight picture and their trigger press and default to more meticulous on each than they need. Yeah. And they also have a tendency to have a lot of dead time in their shooting, have time where they're not doing something. And the way to make the shooting faster is to do everything that isn't breaking the trigger really fast. Or sooner. Or sooner, yes. One, one of our truisms uh, at Sephardic was if you're not doing anything, do it quickly. Yes, um, get it over with. I, I'll, I'll rephrase what you said slightly. It's not that they're overdoing trigger control or sight, sight manipulation. They're just doing it slower. And they're confusing doing it slower with doing it better. Um, if I just pull my trigger slower, that's a better trigger pull. Not, but it's not necessarily. I, I definitely agree with that 100%. Because like, I, hate it. I hate it when people talk about shooting in terms of fast or slow the speed is a byproduct of what you're doing with your shooting, how refined the sights are, how refined the trigger press is. You tell people to go slower and get their hits and what do they do? They do the same messed up stuff they did fast and they do it slow. So now they're slow and sloppy instead of just being sloppy. And that's hey. not the way to do it. The way to do it is to stay fast and figure it out, make it work. Hey, they're slow and they're bad, but, but hey, it works for them. <laughs> You know, I just feel the need to bring up one thing that I'm sure one of the listeners that isn't overly familiar with pistols is going to, they, they can gain this. When you guys are breaking the shot, the gun goes off and it rests again. Where does it usually rest at? It should come right back to the original point of aim. Where you were pointing. Yeah. Yes. It should be consistent, repeatable under stress. And not only that, but at the higher levels, you should be learning to return the gun faster by driving the gun just the right amount to bring it right back to the original point of aim. So if you have a good grip. That's where my eyes are pointing. In different directions. Yes. Because if, I, if, I, if my eyes have already left that target, mm. going to the yes. next target, yes. Okay. Yes. my yeah. gun's not coming back to the first one. That's my true. Coming That's true. Back. I, I should say it's going to return exactly to your index, whatever you're looking at now. Yeah. Yes. That's yes. a good point. Yeah. So if we are just shooting a single single target on a square range, um, press the trigger, gun goes off, sights rest back where they were before. All you have to do is just, just manipulate that, that trigger and not mess up your grip and not mess up the uh, orientation. If the sights of the pistol. don't come back to your eyes, your grip as well. Yeah. Now, if you have to fight that, there's especially a problem. So how does this relate to the firearms rules? <laughs> I, I love shoot. these tangents. That's a really, that's really, a really good question. I don't have an answer don't for it. Well, this I brings just, us back love to these tangents. like the pace of shooting, right? Yeah. Because yeah. you've got deliberate, but then, and this is my terminology. So then you've got reactive and predictive. I actually stole reactive and predictive from Ben Steger, but I came up with deliberate myself to add a third. And so if I'm shooting at a reactive pace, which usually is what you would do in law enforcement or military, usually. I'm waiting for the site to come back to my point of aim, my index, prior to pressing the trigger again. A lot of times in competition, and there are situations in law enforcement and military where this is advantageous as well, 
you'll be doing predictive shooting, which is I'm watching the dot of the front sight come back down and I know how long it's going to be before it's exactly at where I want the round to go. And I'm doing the trigger press so that the timing of both is the exact same time. And that's predictive. The reason why I don't recommend that for most cases in law enforcement and military is just simply the accuracy standards and the penalty for a bad shot are both greater, right? So if you don't need to do that, you probably shouldn't. But a very close range engagement inside a room or that, you know, that self-defense engagement, either for a cop or a civilian, where you're, you know, at arm's length, seven yards and in, and you need to put some serious rounds in an acceptable area rapidly so you can take him out of the fight. That's when you'd be doing that predictive shooting. Because yeah, the target is easy enough and there's a low enough risk. I haven't heard it described that way, but that's how I learned to shoot. That's how I learned to shoot rifles and pistols. Um, I shot uh, DCM, the Distinguished Civilian Marksmanship Program, as as a young soldier, and you know that's that's how you're shooting the rifle because you you cannot hold the X ring at 600 yards. It's impossible. Yeah. Can't be done. But I can hit the X ring at 600 yards. But you know I'm I'm not waiting till I'm holding it to pull the trigger. I'm I'm pulling somewhere in the nine ring, maybe the eight ring, yep. depending on how fast my gun is tracking. And timing it. Yep. Timing the gun. Yeah, absolutely. I like that. Predict. I have, I have not heard it described that way. Like I said, I stole predictive and reactive from Ben, but then I added in deliberate because that covers at least that I can think of all three paces, right? Like all, all the range of pace you would do because I really like, I really try to get away from talking about shooting as fast or slow. Number one, because you don't, like you can train yourself out of tunnel vision. You can train yourself out of auditory exclusion because those, those are negative adaptations to stress, right? And the more stress you receive, the more you're inoculated, the less those will affect you. But that feeling of timelessness is not a negative. That's that flow state that athletes talk about. Um, Samurai talked about it, Mushin, no mind. Like it's, it's universal. You want that. But when you're in that, you don't know if you're going fast or slow. So you need to think about things in terms of technique and which technique is appropriate for the shot I'm making and let that determine your speed. Um, I know that like when I demo for a class, like I'll do, I'll throw up a time on a demo and then I'll watch a student do a time that is slower than mine, but they look much faster than mine felt to me. And that happens every class. Like uh, I put up a PR on one of my drills at Georgia Range Day a couple of weeks ago. Um, I do a drill where I do a, a bill drill on a, <laughs> I do a bill drill on a four inch circle from seven yards um, because it's about the right size of that high center chest group. So it, it shows people that, you know, you need to be able to modulate the accuracy requirement of your shooting as well, not just modulate the speed. Right. And my best ever before that was a 149 and it was a 122, but it didn't feel it didn't feel fast or slow to me, right? So I'm watching students do it. And that run to me felt slower than their three and a half or four second runs looked to me. Am I making sense? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So feelings lie. Yep. Yeah. You, you can't tell time under, under stress. It just doesn't work that way. Your, your brain is a rotten liar. Yeah, it is. And it, and it always has been. I think the bottom line with this, how this relates to safety is we're talking about being responsible and effective with our firearms. Whereas if we're not, that means that we're going to be thrown shots and that's not very safe. Well, what's, um, what's the yeah. common denominator for gross negligent errors, right? The common denominator is one of two things, either a lack of experience guys that are new to something trying to push the envelope and outrun their headlights or it's that guy with 9,000 jumps who's become complacent, right? Like that's, that's when these things happen and that's what you have to guard against. So like that, I think always diving deep into your shooting and not getting complacent about any of the component tasks or how any of them are leads to that continued safety. The initial phase, you just have to really, pay attention until you train yourself out of lack of competence, basically. You gotta really be aware and respectful and understand that this, this is an instrument that can hurt and kill people. 
yeah. yourself included. But then the eventual thing to watch out for is the guy who's been shooting for a long time, but he's no longer plugged into the process. Yeah. Feels like he's arrived. Now he's complacent. And that's when big mistakes happen too. Well, it seems okay. like the worst information is from those that are not the perpetual student. They've, they have arrived. I have all the answers. I don't need to learn anything more. And that's where we get our gun fun. And they've arrived. All right. It just might not be at the destination they're telling you. Mm -mm. That's true. Kurt. I, I, I'll go back to the, to the Nona incident is, you know, you, you, you get to a point you're, you're trying to get better at a task. And this is where those 9,000 jump guys or the, the, the 15 year cop guys, this is where they start to have problems is they're experienced enough and they want to get better. They want to get better at doing something and you get better you know, all, all the physical and mental processes, you eliminate all the wasted time, all the wasted motion. Everything is, is being more fluid. You're, and you start to see your times drop. And then you reach a point where you're at your physical limitation for available speed at that task. Now to get faster, there's only one thing you can do, and that's to change your process. And if you start to change your process by eliminating or cutting corners in safety, you're going to get to a point where safety will be important and it's not going to be there. And if it's important, nothing else will substitute for it. If safety in a, in doing a task is what will keep you alive or keep you whole and you skip that step and it becomes critical at that point, then nothing else matters because you know, your, your gear is not going to save you. Your finger off the trigger is not, none of those other things are going to save you because Safe, you had a critical safety failure at a juncture where it was required to keep you safe. And with experienced guys, I, I don't know if it's complacency as much as they're trying to round corners. And you, you get to that point where there's nothing else to round except safety. And so they think, well, I can get away with it. And maybe they do once, or maybe they do 50 times. But on the 51st time, they don't. And that's when the catastrophic accident happens. Well, and there is, everybody has a point where they max out on the physical attributes of a skill, right? Like everybody's got a, at a draw that's going to be their maximum speed. It's not going to get any faster for them. Um, and I think it's, yeah, it's just important to, there's so many other things you can work on though at that point. Consistency, repeatability under stress, low incident rate of error, like all the other things, right? And think about how valuable it is, like, like say, I'll just throw some numbers out there, right? Say you've got a, a 0.9 draw from appendix concealed. And that is the fastest your brain and body are going to be able to do that safely, consistently, reliably, where you're actually getting a hit on target, right? And that's just, you have tapped out your ability there. Some other guy may have a 0.7, but if you can build consistently and rely, consistency and reliability in yours, then you know, nine times out of 10, or I should say, you know, maybe five, five times out of 10, he'll beat you. And the other five times he'll mess up and you're consistent. You do it every time. Right. So I think that's the thing you have to focus on once you start tapping out on those skill gains is start making them where they belong to you more, where you make fewer mistakes and you can do it under stress, consistently cold, reliably, anytime you need it, that skill is there at that level even if you can't build more speed to go faster. And, that, and that's what we would do if we were perfectly logical. But, you know, I'll, I'll go back to your brain is a horrible, rotten liar. And, and, and it has been lying to you your whole life. <laughs> you, you, you go into a building where everyone in that building is the type a of type A personalities in the whole world. And you want to get better. You want to get better than that other guy. And your brain, your brain is going to lie to you. And it's going to tell you, if you just did this, you'll get faster. You'll get more accurate. You'll get quicker to the breach point. You'll get faster draw. Whatever the task is that you want to get better at, your brain will lie to you. And it will tell you, you can do it if you just do this. You know, I don't think enough people talk about uh, reaching that limit. And for me, the comparison I would use for those that don't quite understand what's going on if we take a Glock, a Glock is basically the baseline of what performance is, and we go up to a staccato. 
there is a steep, okay, you're, it's going to be more expensive, but you're going to be getting more performance, more accuracy, more this, that, and the other. When we go up from there, we go up to my personal experience chambers. That's going to be considerably more expensive at that much more performance gain. When you reach that wall, it's going to take so much more effort to get beyond that. There's a law of diminishing returns. There you go. There you go. There's, there's a law of diminishing returns to performance and to skill. Yeah. Um, and that's why I give up. I'm done. I don't need to do anymore. <laughs> like I'm, I've got some performance goals for myself this year. So I'm currently grinding away with a pretty heavy practice session. It takes me at, at this point in my career, right? It takes me so much more effort to get 1% yeah. gain on improvement like like exponentially more than it used to and how much more difficult with age a lot for for some things for, for some, some things, things not for but some for things. some things it's a lot yeah it depends so if you're young do it now establish yeah, that can. good foundation yes so what does it take for someone to reach gm and then to ma or then to maintain it maintenance is always easier than development right? Maintenance is always easier than development. You can always get away with less if you're looking to just maintain your, your skill. But I would argue that over time, there's no steady state. So in the long run, either you're working at improving or you're degrading. So when we talk about maintaining it, what we're really talking about, if you actually graphed it, is, okay, yeah. now I'm getting too far below where I want to be. I yeah. put a little more in. Okay, now I'm back there again. Yeah. And we just yeah. kind of do this, right? That's really how you maintain it. You yeah. Kind of little waves, but to achieve a high level, it takes a huge amount of work. I would imagine that we're all degrading at different rates and it was going to, it's, we're going to have to go against that negative score to make up for it, to maintain. There's a, I, I can't remember the name of it. There's a, 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 a law of learning that relates to, the, the effort required to learn a task and then the effort required to maintain proficiency with the task. And it's, it was one of those things that like I, as a leader in the army, it was one of those things that I worked really hard at with my guys and my team was making sure that we trained at the things we needed to, to improve a task. And then, you know, where I was already, where, where I already had those train blocks in the, in our task list, I didn't need to do those as much because I could devote, you know, there was bigger payoff by devoting those hours because, you know, that, that, that time resource thing is you just don't ever get enough of it. And it's, you know, where, where can I devote my hours of training so that my team gets the most benefit, which, in, you know, in turn benefits the unit and benefits me because, you know, if my, if my team's better, that's, that's better for me. I always liked the whole, 80, 20 rule, right? Spend 80% of your time on the 20% of the tasks and give you the 80% of the benefit. I think it was Pareto. Pareto, I think came up with that. But like, look at like, you've got high frequency, low skill, low risk. You've got high frequency, low skill, high risk. You've got, you know, you can, you can divide these up and categorize these and figure out, you know, which ones need more effort. But yeah, I think you're completely right. You need to, you have to train smart too. And the one good thing about getting older is you get smarter and smarter about your training. Like that's the one thing I wish I could go back to my, my young self and make me smart about training Yeah, back then. Well, if, if you, you think, think about smarter, it, I just don't remember where I left it. Nice. If you think about it, I'm going to, I'm going to place a wager that all of us started shooting by shooting a mound of dirt and we've just progressed from there. I don't know that or, I or can. At all. Okay, <laughs> you forgot where it was. I'm I'm, I'm, st I'm still shooting at mounds of dirt. <laughs> no, that's just your that's your backstop. Oh yeah. So that's safe. That's right. So speaking of safe, let's talk about priority of life. So going back to the safety stuff in mission mission planning, whether it be military, law enforcement, or whatever. Um, one of the cool things that I found out is that the military doesn't just say, go and shoot everyone necessarily, not necessarily, not necessarily. And I know for a fact in law enforcement, we're not supposed to be doing that. Pro probably not. Yeah. Uh, th this is one of those things where like, cause like my bosses now are all 
State Department people. Um, and this is one of those things like when you tell them uh, I was in the military, they're like, oh, God, I, I know what you guys are going to do. Yeah. It's like you totally you, you totally misunderstand what what actually happens. And this is you know, we talked a little bit about before the the, the army's risk assessment process is extremely regimented. It is extremely thorough. It, it, it gives you a really viable method for determining risk, determining what what you know what are the what are the possible outcomes from from good to bad what are the risks that contribute to those outcomes and then what are my mitigating factors to to solve those risks and then where do i end up if if i apply my mitigating factors to my possible risks now what are my likely outcomes you know where where do i where do i come out that on the end and you know when you when you show that to people they're like oh i had no idea you guys do that and i'm like you know, the, the army's not like you see in a movie. We just, we don't run up and throw a satchel charge at the bunker very often. Except in World War II. Except in World War II. And so why this is important is talking about overall, we, we talked about the firearms rules. We're talking about safety. And that yeah. safety is a self-preservation measure. The, you know, I, I, I used to kid with my team all the time that the reason I, I, that I took their safety personally is because I wanted them to keep me alive and I wanted them to accomplish the missions. It's not because I cared about them. They were, they were, you know, replaceable cogs in the machine, but I needed the mission accomplished and they, I can't get the mission done if my guys aren't there. And, and that's what safety gives you. It gives you your people. And, you know, in, in the case of special forces, it's a tremendous investment in time and money to, to get a guy to the point where he's uh, operationally capable. Um, Cause you know, okay. So you get him through the Q course. Well, he's still got another couple years of training. So really he's functioning on his own that, that, you know, you can turn him loose on stuff. Well, that's that two years of what he's doing is expensive. That, that costs money. And then if I'm not safe and I cause him to get hurt, I've just wasted all that. And that's, that's a really bad investment. Look at how many guys, like I can think of a bunch in my career. Look at how many guys have career ending injuries in training that were preventable. Jumps that, sh- jumps that should have been called. Um, stupid things done that just shouldn't have been done. And guys wind up being out completely. Like it just a fall with rucksack and kit on can take you out just through bad luck. We had a guy had to have his arm amputated from building climbing. Yeah. Yep. And, you know, literally millions of dollars and years of effort spent training this guy. And now he's done. You know, I mean, we, we had a guy before one of our trips over, they were insisting on giving us a jump in Guernsey. We were training up in Guernsey, Wyoming. And this guy had just decades of experience and he was 20th group, but His civilian job was out of Virginia as a contractor working for the government. So lots of experience, right? Building schools. Very um, performing functions and tasks. Um, One could even say maybe he was um, conducting some sort of necessary operations for the government. But anyway, just wealth of knowledge, great guy, solid team guy, huge benefit to the company. And they insisted on doing this jump in high winds, and he was out of the army. Didn't even have him on the deployment. Stuff like that shouldn't happen. I mean, some of it's going to happen. You can't prevent all of it, but that should really be. It's just you see it all the time, and it's a waste. Yep. So how does the sa- how does safety and firearm safety equate to room clearing? or going on to an objective, especially when it comes to non-combatants or unknowns? Well, so like, first off, just think about simply the whole idea about, you know, when you can be off safe, when you can be on, on the trigger. Oh, we All need to go this. beyond that though. Cause I think, oh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, yeah, people I'm don't understand. Yeah. Okay. Like, so there's the one meter rule, right? I mean, Curtle can probably expound on this in far greater detail than me from his time at the schoolhouse, but basically <laughs> You can't shoot if your muzzle is a meter off of your teammate or or his muzzle or anything he's wearing. You have to be a meter away 
from his outline to be able to pull that trigger, right? And then unknowns need to be addressed. But like I was telling you, if in our both our uh, selection and our OTC for SWAT, I got really lucky, Kurt. They gave me three months to train these guys up for a, a police SWAT team. Five days a week, eight hours a day, doing CQB and shooting for three months. And Holy others. cow, that's unheard yeah, that of. Was, that was fantastic. But if they had more than three safety violations in that three months, they were done. And coming off of safe on an unknown or a no shoot was a safety violation. So if they indeed they us, were done it was, anyway. a, it was a minor and three minors is a major. Yep. Three, three majors is a plane ticket. And so safety going off is before you're even bringing up the muzzle. What's the penalty yeah. for bringing your muzzle up? Would that be considered a major? Uh, if, if you're pointing, pointing your weapon at somebody, yes. So you can have a minor and a major in one yes. action, which is contrary to most people's belief. It, it can add up pretty quick. And it's, so pointing guns at people is one of those places where there's so much context. There's so much context. People get flagged all the time. Like, yeah. well, no, no, they don't. And, and if they do, no. they shouldn't. The, you're, you're, you're flagging your teammates because you're an idiot. That, that's, that's why it happens all the time, because your people aren't good. If your people were good, they wouldn't be pointing their guns at each other. No, you shouldn't be flagging your teammates ever. It's just, yeah. And that goes and then, back, yeah. But let's, let's take this like, so let's, let's relate this like a bit further, right? Let's talk about a beat cop riding alone or a civilian for self-defense, right? So we talk about these safety rules and people think of them as something that's, that's dead, it's static, it's on a flat range. Yeah. And it's really not the case. I mean, be aware of your target and its backstop. So I talk about targets with two variables, right? You have difficulty of the target and you have potential risk of the target. So in other words, go back to that kindergartner recess, right? Kindergartners on the playground. If I have an open target at seven yards pointing a gun at me and he's standing in front of a brick wall with no windows, that is a very easy target. It is also a very low risk target. I can engage that target as rapidly as I feel I need to because if I miss, it's going to hit the brick wall behind him with no windows and nobody else is around. Put that same easy target, open target, seven yards, guy with a gun, in front of that hypothetical school ground full of kindergartners at recess, that changes completely the way I'm going to process that shot because now it's a very high risk shot if I mess it up. And I think that we tend to think of the difficulty of the shot, we don't think of the other variable, right? Because it is going to have an effect. So if like these safety rules apply to all of this stuff. If you're moving through a crowd, fingers off the trigger, muzzles not pointed at anybody, right? Um, know the status of your gun, right? Is the gun loaded? Did you chamber around? Is it good to go? Like all these things, they're universal. They're not just for the flat range. Yeah, I, I, it's you know, this is where like you know like we talked about or, or before the show is that you know in in the army safety is built into every level of your operation. The you, you don't discard safety because now we're going on a mission. The the safety is still it's still a part of your planning process as a civilian. You know, when I, I take my wife out to to go to the movie, say in a in a non COVID year. The, something happens and I need to pull a gun and shoot a crazy person. Uh, all of those safety rules still apply because what's the possible outcome of, of an accident? The, with a gun, the possible outcome is always ends in death. The, you know, that is the, the possible outcome of an accident. Well, one of those people that may die because I had an accident is me or my wife, Ni neither of which I want to happen. So, I have to build safety into what I'm doing. I still have to follow those rules. I still have to determine, you know, am I correct and proper to shoot? Do, do I have good target alignment? What's around the target? Can I get a clean shot? Can I end the fight? Can I do these things in a, in a way that achieves the effect that I want? And, and you know, whether that's 
at the mall or the theater or whether that's in a hut in Central Africa, all of those things still apply because the outcome is somebody dying. Absolutely. Yeah. And just like what Pressburg and Blowers and Haggard and a lot of the good guys are saying, too many people are pointing guns when they shouldn't. And it's, it's ignorant. And you guys are providing some awesome information and awesome examples as to why this should not be occurring. And that, that right there is, that's the, that's why I wanted to do this episode to address specifically that. So with that in mind, I think we might've come to the conclusion. It sounds like a good stopping point. Yeah. Um, so before we, before we just cut the feed, where can we find you guys if you want to be found? Uh, any plugs you want to do? Any of that good stuff? Your final thoughts, starting with Matt? I went first last time. Let's let Kurt go first. This okay. Time. It's only fair. Uh, I, I'm not anywhere. USA I, Jobs. I, <laughs> I, I have a personal Facebook and that's it. And I don't accept friend requests from people I don't know. So don't send them to me. Um, but Go join primary and secondary. Look at the forums. Don't just come go. on Facebook because Facebook may not be with us for long. It's true. Uh, no plug for USA Jobs? Um, no, I don't, I don't use them. Okay. Um, go get training. Find a reputable training in your area and go get training with whatever it is that you do. And the two trainers you want to train with more recently, you said? Most on top of my list are Mike Pannone and Scott Jedlinski. And there's a couple other. There's five or six others. But it's, cool. it's a pretty small list. Yeah. You'll have fun with both of those guys. They're both great guys. I, I've known Mike forever. I've known I've known Mike for I, I don't even want to I don't even want to guess how many years. Uh, but I, I've never taken one of his civilian classes. Yeah, I've I've known him since 04 when uh, I did my little stent in triple canopy. He's such a solid guy. Yeah. Yeah. And Matt? All right. Um if you guys are interested in taking a class from me, my website is graybeardactual.com, like I talked about before. Um, I will also be teaching at the Primary and Secondary Summit again. Looking forward to that. I've got some other conferences and things going on as well. Um, it's all on my website, on the calendar. You guys can check it out and see it. Like I said I'm on IG at graybeard underscore actual, um, graybeard actual on Facebook as well. And if you're Ellie or Mill, and you'd like a demo, a T and E, or some training on the 2011 Staccato 2011 specifically, reach out to me through any of those venues, and I'll give you my email address for Staccato, and we can make that happen for you. Just such cool pistols. They're phenomenal. Yeah, they are pistols. I love amazing. mine. Um, big thanks to the panelists. Awesome discussion. I absolutely loved it, and I say that pretty much with every episode, and I mean it. Um, these provide me with a great, great frame of reference. Uh, they help me better understand where I'm at. Um, and it's great just to have a conversation with you guys. Um, let's see here. Big thanks to our, pa uh, big, big thanks to our Patreon subscribers. If you happen to be a Patreon subscriber, um, and supporter, you get a discount to the, actually, let me put an asterisk. If you happen to be a network supporter or greater, you get a discount to our, uh, big training summit. And that is September 4th, 5th, and 6th. Matt's going to be there. A bunch of people are going to be there. We're expanding the uh, instructor pool. We're also making all three days training days. So Monday is not just a throwaway. It's going to be training. Uh, yeah, sh shaking it up just a little bit. Big thanks to our sponsors. Big thanks to Big Tech's Ordnance. Big thanks to Filster Holsters, Primary Arms, Staccato, and Walther. Um, if you haven't already, check them all out. They're all providing some awesome values. As I say, I said at the beginning of this, before you guys got here, um, make sure you're supporting those sources that you found to be beneficial. Um, there's so much good information out there. There's so many good people and there's so many underappreciated people. There's so many great people that are providing great information that don't have the following that the lesser accurate people, I, 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 I'll just call it that, the bad sources. Bad sources are super popular. They're sure entertaining, but they're not education. And they're not necessarily providing you with the best uh, information. If, you're, if they're associated with primary and secondary, I think I pretty much can guarantee 
you're, you're getting some good value out of it. So you should at least follow and support those guys. At the same time, make sure you're following primary and secondary, sharing, liking, all that good stuff. Definitely appreciated. Um, I think that's pretty much it. We are on iHeartRadio, Spreaker, Stitcher, iTunes, even YouTube, believe it or not. Don't know what we're going to do next week. It's probably going to be good also. I think, let's see here. I do have an episode coming up with Ken Good. That's going to be really cool. That's an episode I've been wanting to have for a long time. Uh, we're going to be talking about oh, use of light. Um, I, I've known Ken Good since the 90s. Oh, cool. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So maybe you need to be on too. And, well, and we, we need to get Kurt on too so we can teach him the ways of the light and not the crappy light. Oh, you're muted. Because I, I really want to hear what you have to say. <laughs> You, you can try and convince me that I can actually conceal an X300. Oh, no, 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 no. Um, if anything, it's, I, I'm, I'm hoping we're just talking about overall use of light, and it doesn't have to be weapon light. It can be handheld, um, which I'm, I'm a huge fan of. Me too. Handhelds are awesome. And not that they're a sponsor, but, uh, yeah, the mod light, pistol light is going to be awesome when it's released because I truly believe that's going to be changing some tactics because the spill off that, alone just reduces the, the the chances or even the need to be putting your your muzzle and your light in line with the uh with your th potential threat uh, can't i can't wait. wait to see it yes yes so that's all i'm gonna cut the feed now and uh probably start editing this so we'll talk to you guys later Sweet. have a good night